So the, the text verse is taken from Hebrews 10.35. Uh, the phrase was something that I heard on a talk show of two Christians that were speaking. Some of you might know Max McLean, and uh, he was the one that actually quoted this from a poet. Uh, I didn't catch the name of it, and I didn't go back and find the name, but Max McLean is in a movie now about C.S. Lewis, and uh, from what I hear, it's very good. Uh, he used to do a one-man play in New York City, and he would do C.S. Lewis, and uh, I'm, I'm thrilled because I met him through the radio. I used to do a radio show many years ago, and we have many mutual friends. He's a great man. And it just really struck me uh, that this is so true for right now. If we're not willing to defend something, the other side will take it. So we have to take a stand for the truth of the word. Amen? All right, so this is what it says. What we don't defend, we soon abandon. Hebrews 10 in the Passion, verse 35, says, Don't lose your bold, courageous faith. <laughs> so if he's saying don't lose it, that means they had it. How many here have bold, courageous faith? Just do it by faith. Yes, we do. We do. That's who we are. That spirit that, that created the whole universe is alive in you. Isn't that amazing? In Genesis, it says the spirit of God was hovering over the earth. That's the Holy Spirit that we have inside of us. And try not to just turn him into a person. I know we, we can call him that, but I think that limits our thinking. It's much bigger than just a person. It's the eternal spirit of God that created everything lives inside of you. Like, whoa. And it, with Adam and Eve in the garden, there was no limit other than their physical bodies, but there was no death in the garden. So this was man and woman made in the image of God to live and commune with him forever. And then sin comes in and brings that decay and that death that happens. So we have a taste right now through Holy Spirit in us of what we will have for eternity it's only in part what we will have in full later, and it's called a down payment, right? We can all relate to a down payment. You don't have to pay for the whole house. If you put down a down payment, you have the title deed. <laughs> and the more you yield to Holy Spirit, the closer you are to what it's going to be like for eternity. And I'm going to touch on that today a little bit. So you already have the power source in you, and I would hope that we leave here today with a greater willingness to tap into it. And the way you get to that is by putting other things to death that are blocking that access to that power source. Sorry if that sounds a little too, what, whatever the word is, crude. But Jesus said we have to pick up our cross daily. And, and, and the cross means crucifixion. So whatever I want in God is on the other side of that cross. He's going to raise up the new me on the other side. So don't lose your bold, courageous faith, for you are destined for a great reward. Can you look at somebody and say, you are destined for a great reward. Hallelujah. <laughs> he don't need a mic. <laughs> so listen, the great reward is that we're going to rule and reign with Christ for eternity. All right? It's not that we make the cut and we get, to, we get to get into heaven when we die. That's an awesome thing. It's sure better than the other option. But it's also much bigger than just making the cut and getting into heaven. It's going to rule and reign for eternity. That's the great reward that we have. Don't lose your bold, courageous faith. You have it. Don't lose it. Because, look, things are worth defending. And right in the first chapter of Genesis, God created man in his own image. So when I look at another person... Even all those people coming in and out of that shop right yesterday, I wish I had been there. I was on a plane flying back, but every one of those people was made in God's image. They may not know God, but God knows them. And in the, in the Bible it says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit on some flesh. <laughs> so what does that mean? That just because they don't identify as a Christian doesn't mean that the spirit's not in there. And as you witness and as you demonstrate love and as you say things, as the Bible says, when, you open, when we open our mouths, he will fill it. If it's his words coming out of our mouth, it resonates with something inside them that they know is true. And wow, somebody witnessed to you, that's how you became a Christian, right? So God created man in his own image. That's worth defending. And then it goes on to say, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And that's one of the things that's under attack right now, male and female. Now, you could just choose, uh, one of the comedians said, it's a jump ball, whatever you want, pick whatever side you want, male or, male or female. No, sorry, 
that's a foundational truth that we can't concede. We, we can't concede the language. And I'm not conceding marriage either, okay? <laughs> no, sorry. Man and a woman. You leave your mother and father, and you become united into one, and it's in the maleness and femaleness that we represent God because he made us male and female. That's a long discussion, but you got to be real careful that you don't concede the language to a group of people who want to overthrow order and, and, and overthrow the truth of the word of God. And that doesn't mean we don't like those people. We have to pray for them, but we have to also take a stand for what we know is true. And, and that, uh, that's the church you're in right now, okay? Uh, we're not, we're, you know, marriage is between a man and a woman, a biological man and a woman. And, and this minister has overseen a lot of weddings, but I'm not gonna oversee a same-sex marriage because that's not a marriage. So the way the Lord showed it to me is, uh, like an immune system, we as the church are supposed to be the immune system for the culture when it comes to morals and ethics and the way we live our lives. If we're actively engaged with the community, they will not want to sin because there will be some, what, what we heard up here today, there was something that was getting touched in the hearts of those people. They go in and buy something and they say, thank you for giving me the opportunity to give to someone in need. You know, the area is known for having a lot of money. People around here are wealthy in Far Hills and up the mountain in Burnersville. But there's a huge number of people that are, 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 are week to week. And, and the day laborers that, that serve a lot of those folks. And you understand. But they're, they're hidden. They're, they're not what you see. And we used to have a cafe right across from the train station in Burnersville. We met the whole community, rich and poor, and everybody in between. And we used to do something called Unity Day where we would have a picnic in the park um, to raise money for the fire department and the police in our area. One year we had 4,500 people. Yeah. And, and it was this, the, I didn't even call it this, the town people called it Unity Day. And I knew because I, I would open the, the cafe at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> My family's in the garbage business, so I got started really young, getting up really early, and it never left me. Um, so, you know, we now do deliverance, so that's another form of the garbage business. We get the critters out. <laughs> so we used to serve coffee, and one person would be a wealthy, you know, you could tell by the size of the rock on the lady's finger, she had some money, so I'm just kind of handing the coffee over, and I'm like, whoa, where's the sunglasses? And then the next guy would be dressed to go mow lawns. And God looks at each one of those people with equal value. See, we don't always do that. But on this unity day, everybody was together. And there was a stand for empanadas. <laughs> and some of the people up on Burnsville Mountain didn't even know how to uh, say empanada but they kept coming back for more. And the kids were all playing together on the inflatable rides and nobody cared if you were Hispanic or Latin or whatever you were, like you were kids playing. I don't know if you ever noticed, but kids laughing, it all sounds the same no matter what language they're from. <laughs> it's a kid laughing. <laughs> That's how God looks at us. We just have to stop doing that. And look, let's just be honest. Church hasn't always been great at living that out. And part of the rage and the anger in the culture today is because, you know, if they wanted to think about Christianity, there have been many seasons where we haven't been consistent with what the book says, right? God judges by our hearts, not by our appearance, right? Man looks at the outside, but God looks at the inside. And I wasn't raised in the South, so I can't really honestly say that I would have been courageous enough to stand up against segregation. But I sure hope I would have been. Because there's just got to come a point when you're reading this and saying, well, you know, our church isn't segregated. We were with uh, a couple from Mississippi once, and they said out of the 53 churches in their county, they were the only integrated church. So 52 out of 53 were either all white or all black. Sorry. You know, like you said, I didn't live down there. I'm not saying I could have been a hero or anything, but... Somehow, they thought that, that, that it was still consistent to say you can't come in our church because of the color of your skin. 
How hurtful would that be? And how could you take any meaning from the message? Jesus said, do as they say, but not as they do. But I don't want them saying that about us. Right? So as soon as you start saying somebody can't come in, unless it's because they're dangerous and they're going to hurt somebody, then it's not his church anymore. So look, you know, there's a lot of rage in the culture. Some of it is justifiable, but, but if you live your life looking in the rearview mirror, you don't change. Because there's no solution in the rearview mirror. You've got to look through the windshield, and we want to be agents of change in the positive way. And nobody thinks feeding the poor is a bad idea. So how do we become this immune system as opposed to the opposite of the immune system, which would be to create anger in people because you're not, because you're saying one thing, but you're not demonstrating that. So that's what I'm going to try to talk about. Dig down for that courage. John 16, and the voice says, in this world, you'll be plagued with times of trouble, but you need not fear. I have triumphed over this corrupt world order. <laughs> Hallelujah. We know that's right. And yes, if people see that that's happening in you, they're going to want to have what you have. So the greatest witness is not sermons that you speak. It's the way you live your life, right? That's how I got saved, not through a sermon, by the demonstration of the peace of God that my mother had. Uh, she had witness to me, yes, but what closed the deal was I knew she was tapped into a different source of power than I had, and I needed what she had, or I might not still be here. So thank you, Mom. Rest in peace. <laughs> Jesus, I'm just going to read a little commentary here. It says he, he warns his followers of the mistreatment that they're going to have, okay? Now, nobody here probably likes being mistreated for being a Christian. Nobody likes being persecuted, but there is a point where you have to push back. Right? If you get pushed, you got to push back. And this is what I believe in. It's a free, last time I checked, it's still a free country. Right? And if, and if I say something that you don't like, sorry, but we're still entitled to free speech. Okay? And look, I didn't start the conversation. You asked me, and I'm just telling you what I believe, and I believe what the book says. Now, I know there's a wide range of people that say they believe what the book says, and they're not all in agreement either, but look, there is going to be times if you take a stand for righteousness, the enemy doesn't like it. And it's going to stir that hornet's nest. And you need to have your hazmat suit on to protect yourself. <laughs> so he warns. He says, in this world, you'll be plagued by times of trouble. But don't fear. I've triumphed over the world, over the corrupt world order. He disarms fears by noting the most important things. And, and this commentator says, if the spirit of God is within you, there's no reason to fear. Hallelujah. I mean, you know, I would add, obviously, the word of God mixed with the spirit in us is, is the full formula that we need. And in fact, the church will thrive under persecution. That's always been the case throughout all of history. You know that the church is thriving because even in spite of being brought into the Colosseum to be martyred, Christianity grew. Every time the enemy thought he could use the persecution to stop the church, and you know that from the book of Acts too, right? They started praying, thank you, Lord, that we were worthy to be beaten for your name. <laughs> That's an unusual thing to thank him for. So what is it about the church that allows us to be strengthened under persecution is that we know whose we are and who, whom we have believed. And he who began a good work in me is able to complete it. And I will press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling that I will attain that thing that he chose me for, that, that the reason that he has me here. And frankly, you know, we're all here right now. This is our turn. You're not going to come back 100 years later and say, oh, I wish I was there then. No, you're here now. <laughs> so the idea is help me, Lord, to know what my mission is and then help me complete my mission. So I'm going to just throw in a, a book title here called Anti-Fragile. If you're on Wall Street, you might have read that book. It was written by the same author that wrote a book called The Black Swan, uh, Nassim Taleb. And he's a brilliant guy. It's not the easiest read, but he, he introduces a new word into the culture that's very much pertinent to Christians, right? Because anti-fragile, I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit here. If you look at these three pictures, you can think of a wine glass that's fragile. If you, if you drop it, it'll break. A sword 
is, is resilient or robust, to use their language. If you dropped it, it doesn't break. It's something you can use. But, but anti-fragile is actually something that gets stronger when it gets stressed. And the reason that you see that, that chain there is that's the chromosome. That's to represent our immune system. The only way your immune system is strengthened is by stressing it. And you think hiding behind a mask is going to strengthen your immune system. Sorry, that ain't true. And I think there's enough studies out right now that show if you had the actual virus and you beat it, you have a stronger immune system than what the vaccine would give you. Well, doesn't that make sense? It didn't kill 100% of the people that got it. it. Killed less than 1% of the people that got it, depending on what age bracket you were in, right? And again, we're not trying to dictate to anybody what you should or shouldn't do. I'll write you a letter if you want a letter for religious exemption. I've written a bunch of them. And there really does seem to be an increase in the number of requests that are coming in. So, look, that would create a bunch of stress right there. Guess what? Stress lowers your immune system. <laughs> I mean, really, we, like, the world wasn't hard enough. Now I've got to be threatened with being fired. So that little top part, I don't know if you could read all that up there. But, like, again, if, if something's fragile, that means it's damaged by disorder, to use their words, or stress. If you're resilient, you're not affected by it. But if you're anti-fragile, you actually get stronger when you get stressed. So tough times don't last, but tough people do. That was the world saying. So we need to be an anti-fragile Christian. We know who we have believed. We're, we're standing firm on the rock of our salvation, right? Those people that are persecuting me right now may not agree with me. I'm going to try to speak the truth in love. But at the end of the day, I'm not going to renounce my faith. Okay, that's my first identity is as a Christian, son and daughter of a living God. So let's keep looking at a few more verses. It says in uh, prior to our text verse, which was 35, 32 says, don't you remember those days right after the light shined in your hearts? And, you know, most people are, are witnessing the most right after they get saved, right? Because the people that meet you are like, what happened to you? You don't even look like the same person. Oh, my God, I got saved. I found Jesus. I saw the light. <laughs> right? And, and they're very enthusiastic because they just got delivered from some drug addiction or whatever. And God came through for them, and they're excited about it. And when you first see that light, another translation says, when you were illuminated. Don't you remember those days? It's the writer saying. Right after you, that light shined. You endured a great marathon season of suffering. That's a good use of language, isn't it? Hardships, yet you stood your ground. And if you don't leave with anything else today, that's what I'm telling you to do. Stand your ground. Stand your ground. You got the backing of 2,000 years of truth right in this book right here. And if you need help, that's normal. We all need help. You need people to come alongside you and pray with you. And, and you know, often people will call me way before COVID. They would call me and say, oh, I'm dealing with this thing on my job. What would you do? How could you handle this? And we would pray together and, and they would come back and thank me later, right? Because we need that. Just let somebody else into your world to give you advice that you trust. You endured a great marathon season of suffering hardships, yet you stood your ground. At times you were publicly and shamefully mistreated, being persecuted for your faith. Then at other times you stood side by side with those who preach a message of hope. You sympathize with those in prison. I'm telling you, this is a very convicting portion of scripture right here. Because Hebrews 10 is right before Hebrews 11. Wow, pastor, that's deep. <laughs> because you know Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith, right? So he's talking really about faith even in chapter 10 too. It's just, he, he, gets, he starts naming people specifically by faith, Abraham, by faith, Moses, right? Right down the line. But this is just speaking to the general crowd. When you first got saved, you endured some hardships and you stood your ground. And you even sympathized with those in prison. How about this one? And when all your belongings were confiscated. <laughs> Easy to pass over that line. It must not mean that. They would let their all their goods be confiscated? You accepted that violation with joy. Sorry, I'm going to go slow. It's painful. <laughs> Convinced that you possess a treasure growing in heaven that can never be taken away from you. <laughs> That's what standing your ground means. 
you could charge all the bluster you want at me right now. I know where I'm going. And even if you took my life, I'm still going to a better place. <laughs> so my mother said when she had the car accident, I, yeah, a lot of you are new, but she flipped her car over. It was a terrible thing that happened. And, uh, and, and the has, I'm sorry, the, the 911 guys came and showed up, and they're cutting out, you know, cutting a hole because her car was flipped over, and she's upside down. And they're like, lady, are you okay? And she's like, yep. <laughs> I'm a Christian, and if this is my time, I know where I'm going. That's called passing the test right there. And they said, Rev, well, we never saw anybody do that. Most people are freaking out. So look, you know, she knew she possessed a treasure that was growing in heaven that could never be taken away from her. Can we just think about that for a minute? Like that's really the drive to take a stand is because this life is just a partial picture. It's not the whole picture. We get to spend eternity with Christ. Not just spend it, but rule and reign with him for eternity. So when that's your driver every morning when you get up, it's like, yeah, you know, it is a little tough out there. But I don't mind taking a stand for truth. Somebody took a stand for truth in my life, and my life completely changed because of that. Much for the better, I could tell you. So don't lose your bold, courageous faith. For you're destined for a great reward. You need the strength of endurance to reveal the poetry of God's will. Woo! Wow. Think about that. And, I, you know, again, I could just tie it into my own story. It was poetry to watch my mother walk through a crisis when I was still outside the kingdom and, and saying, what is so different about her? And we were both grieving this horrible murder that happened in our family and our our lives were so disrupted and flipped upside down. And, you know, you've heard that expression, the rug was pulled out from under me. That's a real graphic description of how it is emotionally. The whole rug of your life just gets yanked out from under you and you have no idea how you're even going to stand up again emotionally because it's such a trauma. And yet, like, there was poetry in the... Was it that she wasn't grieving? She had another source of strength that I didn't have that would be very hard to put into words. Poetry of God's will. And then receive the promise in full when we get there. And, you know, we would all like to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And none of us get a perfect A-plus score on every test, right? He doesn't judge by that. He judges by how hard we're trying. <laughs> how important is it to you? Well, you know, he's not an Indian giver. I'm not going to lose my salvation. Boy, if that's your stance, come up to the altar and get prayer. Because that should not be your goal, just to make the cut to get into heaven. And I won't lose my salvation. What a miserable way to live your life. We're trying to be more like Christ every day. How would he do it? Mm. For soon and very soon, the one who's appearing will come without delay. And he also says in Habakkuk chapter 2, 3, 4, this is right in the book of Hebrews, my righteous ones will live from my faith. Isn't that awesome? Any righteous ones sitting here? Sounds like a trick question, right? Tim shot the hand right up. Uh-oh, he's trying to trap us. <laughs> there is none righteous, no, not one. <laughs> right? You get all this flooding of verses coming in. But he's referring to people who live by faith, right? And this is a very famous verse in the Reformation. The just shall live by works. Oh, right, you caught me. Bummer, wrong translation. The just shall live by faith. Whew, not giving indulgences is what Martin Luther was living with, right? My righteous ones will live from my faith. But if fear holds them back, my soul is not content with them. Easy verse to miss, isn't it? Can't we just stay on the just shall live by faith? Well, no, because Habakkuk said, be careful. You can't let fear come in, and fear's been rampant in America, and it's Right, like again, it's not meant to shame anybody, but it's not a good symptom if I'm operating in a lot of fear. I should, I should be getting prayer for that. Uh, you, know, you don't make good decisions when you're operating out of fear. You're emotionally hijacked, and the peace of God passes all understanding. And we, we can hear the Lord better, and you might have heard me quote John Paul Jackson. He said, peace is the potting soil of revelation. So if you want to hear from the Lord, your spirit has to be at peace, not emotionally hijacked, right? We are certainly not those who are held back by fear and perish. 
In Jesus' name, that's true for all of us, right? We are among those who have faith and experience true life. That's the voice version, Hebrews chapter 10, right in the 30s there, if you want to go back and look at it. And then he quotes Habakkuk. Uh, so I'm just going to give you a famous verse from Habakkuk. It says, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor the fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. <laughs> I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Some of you need to read that verse. It gives you strength. It's part of that immune system. How can we as the church be a strong immune system for the culture if we don't have a, a strong immune, spiritual immune system in our own lives? Well, one way is we do it together. And what's lacking to me, you fill the gap. I'm telling you, we need each other. This is not a, a Lone Ranger kind of operation. Whew, they punish people putting them in isolation. Humans are obsessed with power and political prominence as a means to influence the culture. Christian citizens have an obligation, according to the word of God, to strive for justice and freedom through the transforming power of the spirit in people's lives. Meditate on that for a minute, right? The Lord is saying, you don't just keep this for yourself. You be a witness for me. A witness means that, that you're living an example in the way you're living your life that shows that there's something different about you. We have an obligation, this author says, to strive for justice and freedom through the transforming power of the Spirit in people's lives. Rather than this temporal power, the real work of the kingdom often thrives under fierce attack and opposition. That's the commentary from John 16. In this world you will have trouble, but fear not, for I have overcome the world. See, that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. This is not an observational sport. It's a participation sport. You are here to advance God's kingdom, not just make the cut when you die and get into heaven. That's too lukewarm. We don't even want to look at that verse. Can you hang in a little longer? Nick, could you lay hands on some other people? I'm not going to keep you long. So. I'm going to give Nate a room in my house. It's going to be called the Barnabas room of encouragement. <laughs> so I'm just going to stay here in the New Testament for a little bit, and then we'll close. It says, we are treated as dying, and yet we live. Who's talking? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Yeah, that's Paul, right? And look, you know, he, he persecuted a lot of Christians before he got converted on the road to Damascus. His life was completely turned around. And God said to the, to the man he sent to pray for him, a man named Ananias, you need to go and talk to him and tell him that he's my chosen vessel and I have to show him all the things he's going to suffer in my name. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> I don't want to suffer. What are you talking about? Well, look, you know, if, somebody, my, if my mom wasn't willing to suffer the persecution I gave her before I said yes to the Lord, she could have taken the easy way out and said, well, you know, too bad. I got mine. No, but she loved me, and I was not living a good life. So here he goes. He's going to just give us a list. He said, we're treated as dying, and yet we live, as punished, and yet we're not executed. Though we're sorrowful, we continually rejoice. As the poorest of the poor, we bring richness to all. And though we have nothing, we possess all things. <laughs> what was he talking about? When you got the Spirit of God in you and you know the Word, and he definitely knew the Word, right? Like, that's one thing we know about Paul. From being a Jew, he was studying under the best. He went to Harvard, effectively, and, like, he knew the Word. And then God gave him a download of what it means in the New Covenant. And it's like, yeah, we may not have a lot of physical possessions, but we possess all things. And then it's similar in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24. It says, five times I've withstood the 39 lashes. It would be really easy for us to pass by that one, but I'm not, because I just saw a, a, an outtake from the movie uh, The Passion of the Christ with the actor Jim Caviezel, who played Christ. And in the scene when he was being whipped, 
the way they do it in the movie, they put a board on your back so that you're not getting whipped. That would have, it'd be a problem with the actors' union on that one, huh? But they did the whip, and they hadn't put the board in. So he felt one of those 39. And, he, you know, obviously that was something he'll never forget. And here's what he didn't know. It's not just the pain on your back. It's that it pushes all the air out of your lungs. When that whip hits your back, <laughs> there goes all the oxygen. And guess what? <sighs> Doing that ain't so easy because your back's killing you. So you want to breathe. And just when you start to breathe a little bit in, here comes the next one. <laughs> Whatever little bit you had in there, that's gone. So it's not just the pain. It's showing you what it's like to die of suffocation because you can't breathe. Before they put you on the cross, where you do die of suffocation because you can't breathe. You know that one. That's, that's some other day's topic. But five times he took 39 lashes and wouldn't renounce his faith. <laughs> so what we don't defend, we will soon abandon. That's happening in the culture today. Sorry, it's happening. we got to be honest. Church isn't always willing to defend what the Bible says. There's no decaf version of Christianity, right? Well, it tastes like coffee. Sorry. You're either all in for this or don't bother because that's the lukewarm piece, right? You know, we're all in. Well, you might lose your tax-exempt status. Like, think about Paul being right here right now. And I say, you know, Paul, we're a little worried. We might lose our tax-exempt status. He would be like, do you have a barf bag nearby? Like, please. What are you talking about? What's a tax-exempt status? It has nothing to do with anything. And we're worried about our job, and we're worried about losing tithers. And please, that's what he would say. Please, you're missing the message. It's way bigger than a tax-exempt status. No, okay, I could say that. My job and my house is not on the line. But that's intentional. You know, Paul had a job too. He worked, he knew how to make tents. You're not going to starve if you're not a pastor. You'll find it. You're not going to lose your church because they're not going to take your tax exempt status because the Constitution guarantees us the right to religious freedom. All right? So they're just making a threat. It's one more threat. Stop. No. Speak the truth. Do it in love. <laughs> Three times I was battered with rods. Once I was almost stoned to death. And he doesn't say, and then I got up and went back and finished the message because they didn't kill me, right? <laughs> Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent one day and night adrift on the sea. I've been on many journeys facing extreme circumstances, perilous rivers, violent thieves, threats by my own people, and threats by my not own people. <laughs> the Jews and the Gentiles are getting threatened by everybody. I have faced dangers in the city, in the wilderness, at sea, danger from spies among our own brothers. I've survived toil and hardship, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst without a crumb in sight. Bear to the cold. Maybe think of that movie Revenant. I've never been colder watching a movie than watching that movie. <laughs> and then I'm going to finish. There's two more. In any different part of scripture, he says in the book of 1 Corinthians, I'll stay in Ephesus until Pentecost because a wide door for effective service has opened to me in Ephesus. It's a very promising opportunity. You know, we talked about how God opens up these sliding doors for us, but they don't stay open forever. We have to step through it while it's open because it will close. And then we would hear that verse that says, don't miss your day of visitation. This is an opportunity the Lord's given us, which I believe that's the season we're in right now. That's the Mario Murillo idea. Like, this is the time that the church will, will shine through persecution because we have the truth, and the world has never been more confused. If they can confuse you about whether you're a boy or a girl or not, that's a big problem. And there are many adversaries. Uh, don't you love it? So Paul's like, oh, man, I'm going to stay a little longer because i got this great opportunity. And by the way, there's also many adversaries. No, I'm not too happy about that part. But look, if you want something to get stronger, it has to be stressed. 
they tried growing trees in, in those biospheres, and the tree would get to a certain height, and it would fall down. Why? There's no wind in a biosphere. The reason the tree could stand is because it's constantly getting pushed by the wind. And then you don't get no fruit if the tree's not still standing. Get it? Like, wow, there's so many ways you could compare it. So then he says, with great endurance, what do we do? We persevere. With great endurance, we persevere. Even in anguish and hardship, we've been cornered by the enemy, suffering beatings and imprisonments and uproars and toil, sleeplessness and starvation. <laughs> Don't you, aren't you glad he's on our side? This is a courageous man right here. Nothing was going to stop him from fulfilling the calling. And you can understand why Ananias was told by God, you're going to have to go and show him all the things he's going to have to suffer for my name. And look, I'm not into suffering, believe me. But I am also willing to push back on things that I believe are true. And there's a whole bunch of pushing going on right now, trying to tell us what, what box we have to fit in. And I'm not going down without a fight. Sorry, got the wrong guy. My inner middle linebacker is coming back out. <laughs> it's kind of a problem when you like being a middle linebacker, but I got healed, I hope. All right, can we stand? Because this is, I'm going to end here. Because this is the good news part of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, right? He, he went through all the things that he suffered. And my, my prayer for all of you today is we leave with an impartation of more courage. Because there's nothing about being a Christian that's wimpy. We take a stand for truth, right? That's, that's what we know. We, we, we in, integrate this book into our lives. And yes, they'll know us by our love, not by our anger. God is love. But that doesn't mean that he tolerates sin. Paul was real clear about that. There's not a license to sin just because there's grace. It's like, no. Know who you are in Christ. And if you get pushed, you got to push back. Sorry, like, you know, not violent with your words. This is what the word says. This is what I believe, and you're not getting me off my position. Amen. So here he says in verse 6, by the Holy Spirit, with purity, understanding, patience, kindness. Wow. That's a little different than, than being angry. But no, it's by the Holy Spirit. This is how we do it. Sincerest love, we've proved ourselves. He's talking to the Corinthians. And now with the voice of truth and the power of God, armed with the right, I'm sorry, on the right and armed on the left with righteousness from God, we continue. Anybody here willing to continue? All right. In spite of persecution, in spite of being pushed a little bit, like we're not going to cower. It says, Abraham staggered not in unbelief. I'm not going to stagger if somebody challenges me. Whether respected or loathed, praised or or criticized as fraud yet true, as unknown to this world, yet well known to God. Whoa! Say that with me, all right? Unknown to this world, yet well known to God. Look at somebody. David, you are well known to God. Woo that should make you feel way better. Everybody in here is well known to God. And he expects us to be his ambassador. Look at you going in the wrong direction. Nate made the slides go back. <laughs> You're not that good. <laughs> so what does it say? What do we do? Lift our hands, all right? Come on, let's just lift our hand. Lord, we choose, like Isaiah said, here am I, send me. When you said, whom will I send? He said, here I am, here am I, send me. And whatever that means, we don't know what that means, and we're not going to go out on some risky operation without receiving counsel from people that we love and trust, but just let it be in our mindset, Lord, that we have a limited time here, and this is our turn right now. This is our turn. It's not going to be another time, another place. If not now, when? Now's the time that we take a stand Now's the time that we speak the truth and do it in love, but not just coil in, in, in cowardice. You know, when, when Paul said to Timothy, God hasn't given you a spirit of fear, that's the underlying word is coward. There's nothing about being a Christian 
that's, that's about being a coward. So, Lord, we just lift our hands to you and say it's not by our might or by our power, but it's by your strength in us that will give us the courage and, and the brave heart that we need to face persecution, but to do it with the, with the understanding that we have such a better final destination. There's nothing anybody in this world could do to us that could rob us from that future hope that we have. And Lord, we say let your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth today as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen.